Greetings, Vault Hunters, and welcome to Echoes from the Borderlands. This podcast is going to explore the iconic Borderlands franchise through conversations with the writers, devs, artists, and others who are responsible for its creation and its success. I'm your host, Joel Watson, and today we are talking about the game that managed to fit 17 million weapons onto an Xbox 360 disc, and it's the one that started it all, the original Borderlands. I'm joined by co-founder of Gearbox Software and founder of Gearbox Entertainment Company, Randy Pitchford, and Borderlands writer and creative director, Mikey Newman. Welcome. Hello. Hey. (laughs) Borderlands is a 2009 sci-fi RPG first-person shooter. Uh, released on October 20th, 2009. By December 2009, it had sold over 2 million copies. By February of the following year, 3 million. By August of 2011, 4.5 million. And today has sold, the franchise has sold over 80 million copies of Borderlands games. Uh, It's got a bold, unique art style, an expansive platform-spanning storytelling, and it's established the looter-shooter genre as a gaming mainstay. But let's start before the beginning. The origins of Borderlands. Randy, what was the state of Gearbox before Borderlands development began? What were your successes? What was the studio known for? Well, we had, you know, we'd been doing some work for hire stuff with some pretty big franchises back in the late 90s and early 2000s. And we had just launched an original game uh, called Brothers in Arms, which Mikey and I also worked on together. I directed it and Mikey wrote it. Mm-hmm. And that was that was amazing. And it was a big hit. And, uh, and you know, I, I, I couldn't, I don't know, I just kept reinvesting. So the, the, the plan after Brothers in Arms was, okay, let's do more Brothers in Arms, but let's also create some new things. So I, I, I put a couple of boats in the water. Uh, one boat was going to be um, uh, going back to those roots of, of working on properties that other people owned, working doing work for hire kind of work. Um, and the other was let's do something crazy, wild, and original. Brothers in Arms was awesome, but we kind of borrowed style and like, th- like themes. And I don't want to say story, like, cause obviously the story was original. Um, but the, you know, the backdrop was borrowed. We, we didn't really invent anything in, you didn't in, invent world war two. That's correct. Sure. We, we built, we, tried. A, we, <laughs> we, we, we did, we did, we did create a new game design paradigm and right. the, with the tactical gameplay and the way squad command worked. And, and, and there's people that are still aping some of the, you know, some of that interface, but, um, but we didn't invent the style, you know, we borrowed from the exist. And with Borderlands, the, the goal with the original thing was let's let's take a risk on every front. Story, style, and design. Let's let's go, let's go ape on it. Did let's you go. look at the market and say something's missing? Uh, I don't know if I'd say look at the market. <laughs> look at the slate of did you look at the games you were playing and the games that people were buying and say we this is not what we're able to do? Or I think do I think after. I look, you know, you you don't want to you don't want to go deep in, in without validating the market potential, but our creativity doesn't start with the marketplace at ten, or like with a commercial kind of view. It starts from more of a creative kind of perspective. What do we want to build? Yeah. So like for me, the, you know, before, before uh, Wolfenstein 3d and before I moved to Dallas and got, became a part of making, you know, the first person shooters be a thing. I was traditionally like a, a like a role playing game gamer. I, I liked, um, I mean, the I, the game I often credited is is the game that I've played the most of, and the game that I love the most is a game called NetHack. Sometimes I talk about like Colossal Cave Adventure, but these are like adventure games and role playing games. And then Wolfenstein happened, and I kind of before that thought action ga- action games are kind of for dumb people. You know, they're just like oh, caveman, real fast, <laughs> you know. And I wanted more thinking, right. more depth to it. But 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 Wolfenstein kind of showed me. Action games, ha- like there's some merit to that moment to moment fun. And and as we were creating the first person shooter genre, you know, I was part of the original Duke Nukem team and I worked at Apogee after Wolfenstein. Um, we, um, we were figuring it out and we kind of learned that that moment to moment fun is all you need for engagement. There was no long-term growth in a game like Duke Nukem, right? Like yeah. the, the, the weapon, the numbers on the keyboard, you know, go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. That's the number of weapons you have. And the skills of Duke Nukem at the very beginning of the game and the first level are identical to the skills that he has at the very end of the game. It's, and so there's, it's all moment to moment. There's no long-term engagement. So the, the hypothesis was, are these things mutually exclusive? 
could you have the moment to moment fun of a shooter and the long range engagement of like an RPG? And can those actually fit together? Cause nobody had ever done that before. And we believe, no, they're not mutually exclusive. We can, we can meld them and make that, make that amazing. It, and that, you know, it's that almost a, a game as a toy. Uh, when you think of Duke Nukem, it is fun to play <laughs> no matter when you play it, no matter how long you play it, five minutes or an hour, it's fun. Yeah, no, I mean, that's what moment to moment gameplay is about, you know, and a lot of, you know, it's funny because, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the, the, the free to play kind of cell phone games are in that same kind of vibe where, you know, they're really fast and there's, they're meant to be played on the toilet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or when you're late, <laughs> waiting in line at the grocery store or right. whatever, um, the, the, but you know, it's about quick engagement, right? But that, but it's not mutually exclusive with with long term engagement. And by putting the two together, that's what we stumbled upon. But at the beginning, like it started from that game design conceit. We didn't have a story or a universe. Right. We had a game design premise, and we had to build the story in the universe around it. Mikey, how did you join in? How did you uh, find yourself at Gearbox? I was I was uh, a creative director on one of those other boats. Um, so I came over to Borderlands kind of late it was it was right as the art style was changing um which well, no, I, I mean was gearbox in, in in general like i mean i know you oh, were, oh, you were the beginning of gearbox. let's let's go back mikey come on oh, counter-strike God. okay so I was, I was working on this little game called counter-strike <laughs> and this little game called day of defeat um uh yeah and and gearbox was doing uh counter-strike condition zero one of a few companies to work on that game. Uh, and I was a texture artist. I started as an artist and brothers in arms rolls around. And I was like, I can write. And then I hooked up with Colonel Antal and, uh, yeah. Did you, feel yeah. You, didn't, you didn't, you didn't hook up with Colonel Antal. You collaborated and worked with Colonel Antal. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Phrasing. <laughs> If you hooked up with Colonel Antal, you'd be dead. <laughs> <laughs> um, was it? What was your feeling going into writing your first game, and how did that inform the challenge of, of starting to write Borderlands? I I think one did not inform the other. Uh, like it's weird that I wrote Brothers in Arms in the Borderlands because they could not be less similar. Right. Um, I Road to Hell Thirty is sort of. It's like the most realistic game, but also some like ideas from a 25 year old snot head. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> War is bad. I'm smart. I, I you know, uh, that was but, the uh, like, it definitely like helped a lot. Borderlands rolled around and that was the thing me and Randy really wrote together over like 40 hours. <laughs> well, well with Christy too, though. Remember like I, like she wrote all the, like she wrote a bunch of stuff and then she wrote it under my direction, which was like, frankly, boring. your wife, Christy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Frankly, boring. And, and, they, and it was like, Hey Mikey, make this not suck. <laughs> <laughs> and Mikey punched everything up and like just wrote on top of it all. Like, and, uh, it, it was awesome. Once was, you decided to make this game and go in this new direction and, and make something you hadn't seen before, when did you have an elevator pitch? When did you know what you were going to make and started sharing that idea with people? Oh, very, very early. Um, I remember, um, there was just a hand, there was just a few of us. And there was this guy that I worked with back at a company called Rebel Boat Rocker before I founded Gearbox uh, named Rob Hieronymus, who's a brilliant designer. And he, he also was with us when we founded Gearbox um, and did some of the early stuff when we were doing work for hire, but he'd left the company and was doing some other stuff. And I, I knew, I knew he could be meaningful to the design of the game. And it was like, like I think it was like Matt Armstrong and Mark Tardiff and I and I and went and pitched him. Did you feel like there was a if he gets it, everyone will get it? Um I no, I just wanted him to get it because I wanted him to help. Okay. And so like I, I wasn't that was, I didn't go into that thinking it was a test. Um, but it did that was like I think the first time I did like what you would consider an elevator pitch for Borderlands. What was it? It was basically what I just said, like, yeah. hey, like shooters and RPGs aren't mutually exclusive. Put them together. Let me let's let me talk about how they can fit. Okay. And what how amazing would that be? And and that was that was the pitch. Um, we didn't even have a style or a story conceit yet. And I remember when when Matt Van Dolan joined the project um, as our art director, and we were kind of fishing for the art direction. And we came up with like six or so different like style concepts. And the one we went with was actually realism. 
back at the beginning. Yeah. We did a realistic art direction, um, and it didn't fit. You know, the game design was just batshit. And, <laughs> and, and, and the, from a, and, and, and the universe also, like trying to find the universe, because the, the game's about killing people and taking their shit. <laughs> how do you, how do you make, how do you, you have to come up with a universe where you can be a hero. The design demanded, the de design demanded kill people, take their stuff. How do you, how do you, how can you be a good guy? So, yeah. It was nine toads that really like solidified it in my head. Like once you realize that he has nine toes cause he cut off one of them with his gun, <laughs> the clipper with the blade on the front. Like once I understood that, I was like, oh, this game is fun. <laughs> when you started giving that initial pitch internally at Gearbox or maybe even to other people in the industry, did you get pushback? Um, well, we, we didn't really talk much to the people that weren't with us. So at the beginning it was about talking with potential publishing partners. Gearbox at the time could not self-finance development. Um, also we couldn't reach market. We weren't a publisher back then. If you wanted to sell a video game, you had to be able to a have a license, a publishing licensing agreement with one of the first parties. So you can make an Xbox or a PlayStation game. And then B you had to be able to manufacture and distribute physical packaged goods right. and sell them to places like comp USA and fricking Babbage's, <laughs> you know, and like, um, you know, so so like we had to, no matter what, we were working with a publisher that had those relationships with retail and had those relationships with the platforms. And and so, and they were, if we were going to need them anyway, they were all willing to like let us, give, give us the money we needed to make the right. game, as they called it, advances. So we'd figure out what the rev share was and then they'd advance us the, the development uh, cost. So that, that was going to happen no matter what. So I, I went and talked to, to, uh, uh, all, I guess all the publishers I could at the time. And most of them, you know, didn't really bother, but we had a, we had a few running after it. And, um, and that, you know, that when, all you need is two really. And you got, you're going to, you're going to get, get some fight. <laughs> yeah. You're going to, you're going to get a, you're going to get a deal you like if you have yeah. at least two. Once, we you had like, into, once you get into Babbage's, you're gold. <laughs> Walden software, you're gold. <laughs> but well, you know, we had two publishers vying for us and, you know, or actually we had three publishers and, um, and so that, that, that made me really confident that, okay, this is bankable. Um, and, and, and we did that deal before we began pre-production. So it wasn't like I was like deep, overly invested. We, we went through concept development and that was, that was when I sold it. So you've got the concept that you want, you know, the type of game you want to play and you know, the elements you want to combine. Mikey, what got story talk going? Where, where were you? Where was the first time that you thought this is a way, for instance, we can make these, uh, looters and shooters, uh, the good guys or, or was that not even part of the process? I, in my head, the process, I remember it is, as make people that you want to hang out with for possibly a long period of time and make people that you will listen to that are like, Hey, I don't really know you, man. Uh, but could you just go murder like 12 people for me? I will give you a sandwich. Uh, <laughs> there, there is an element from the first, you're like, oh. from the first moment of the first borderlands games that carries on through the entire franchise, which is, Hey, I've got a problem and I'd just rather not solve it. Um, so check out the hook while the DJ revolves exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> what, what, what would it take for you to go kill my problem away? And then that's just, that's, that's, I, that, that definitely like the moment in, in Borderlands where Scooter tells you he was going to kill someone and then does that was, that was what solidified it for me. <laughs> When you oh no to me it was like the the best scooter stuff like when you get into the what was it the 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 was it Rust I don't remember which was it the dust Rust comedy yeah somewhere around anyway you get in there and scooters like hey like uh, this I want you to mess this guy up for me don't kill him though because I'm gonna kill him on a later occasion right. he messed up my mama's girly parts and I just want you to show <laughs> him who's right. boss that is yep. and I was like I okay this is the first thing he said this line. is the one I think that's the first thing he that, that's your it's almost your introduction to the yeah. game so yeah but like I'll, like yeah. I'll, it goes back earlier like remember Mikey when like we needed a we needed a patch we had like we had this awesome kind of introduction with claptrap and getting into the environment but like it was too far before the next beat so that's when i was like i created the tk baja baja character as a concept i'm like mikey like let's work like right figure this out you know and uh and like we were just art ourselves doing the voice and we i think we already knew like oh we'll just have eddings read that too 
And uh, I think he wrote yeah, to him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, is, well, that was what was so funny about Borderlands because it was a lot like Brothers in Arms 1 in that way. We're like, we're doing a lot of the voices to kind of prove it out as we're going before we get to like the full. Because you, you were crazy or all that was never not the case. But we all know? just sort of did temp voices. And we're like, I guess yeah. this is good enough. And it just held. You Does know, that we, say we a lot about not- where Gearbox and the industry were? at that place like because that kind of thing doesn't fly as much these days i think it said a lot about our budget yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) it does sure i i remember being like oh randy wants to do a voice and then you were like so good and so interesting and like cartoon ready I, that always impressed me well, i was like randy's a voice actor what the no, hell t- you know sometimes you have like an idea of how it should be and like you know you're not yeah. the right guy for it so you're like remember when we were in the booth and we figured out the marcus voice and it was like, yeah. you remember that? Like, and I was like, okay, you, 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 like you'd already, we, you and I beat that intro back and forth like twenty times. I think, like, we were like just yeah. th- throwing that back and forth before we had the script. Yeah, beat by beat. And then it was like, um, okay, it's kind of like Watto from Star Wars, but also right. like, right, also right. like Sala from Is Indiana any? Jones. So like, Mikey and I were just ad libbing in the booth, like, I don't know, like, do it like this, you know? And he's like, no, Mikey's yeah. like, no, no, more like, and like, we were kind of like, okay. And then the guy just tried it, and it was like that. But sometimes, you, so you're not sure, and you have to find it with the actor. Right. But then other times, like, I kind of just, I don't know, Crazy Earl was just this, like, I just wanted him to be this super hick hillbilly, but different than what Mikey was doing with Scooter. Like, I wanted him to be just right. literally insane and just, like, totally afraid of, like, not cool with anybody. Coming from Texas, you know good and well that there are uh, lots of different kinds of hillbillies. So <laughs> I, I went into the booth and recorded a third of the script with Scooter just like this, just a normal Texas accent. Right. And everyone was so bored. <laughs> and finally, I just start screaming Honey, like this. Honey, we all sound like that. Obama. That's what it was. It was that uh, Obama. Obama. It was Obama. This, okay, and they everybody found started it. laughing just because I shouted Obama. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, <laughs> there it is. Mike, as far as the world, y- y- you know where you want to go with the characters? You want you want pals, right? You want murder pals to hang out with. The world is a little Mad Maxy. It's a little space westerny. Um, were you thinking about those kinds of influences, or did it just come together? I yeah, we talked about Firefly a little bit, like it, it, clever sort of western in space, but also post. I mean, it's in there in my own brain, but I don't know if like every everyone's influences were kind of different, and that's what I really loved about the chaos of Borderlands. Wagon it train. was just like wagon train in space. That's yeah. right. <laughs> um, speaking of wagon train in space, let's talk about the world building, world building elements of Borderlands, the status quo of the Borderlands galaxy. Evil corporations uh, seem to be the looming threat, the driving force, uh, stripping worlds of resources, uh, displacing people and putting rich colonists in their place, making everyone that isn't a rich colonist suffer. <laughs> Is this, I mean, that that theme carries again through the entire it's Borderlands pretty franchise. Pressure. But it, you know, it's it's funny. The corporations aren't evil. They oh, just, I can't they wait just, for this perspective. They just they just want <laughs> they just want to make money. And because the ones that are actually good at that end up with people that are you know. They're there just, are no ethical they're, space they're billionaires. Just, they're just used to having everything go for them, so they become these fucking intolerable assholes. Um, and that that's you know one. It was actually one of the fun things we did with the pre sequel was trying to play with like, hey, can we at all let you like relate to Handsome Jack? Is there any chance of that? Like, what if we go back before he was like as bad as he was? Um, and of course, you know, he's still in it. I hated him. Like, I love him, but I hate him like through the whole through The way the whole that thing. story is crafted, it tricks you into feeling bad for him and then instantly yeah. unrewards you yeah. for feeling bad yeah. for yeah. him. Yeah. Punishes we, you. We do that a lot. Like, Mike, Mike, Mikey had a lot of good ones with Claptrap, you know, where it's like the whole, the whole secret to that character is when he's fine and up, He's like insufferable and you just fucking hate him. And then, and then what happens is that tears him down to a world like the word. <laughs> no one shows up to his birthday party. Right. And then you're just like, you just feel sorry for him. And the second you give him an inch, you regret it, you know, because he exploits that and becomes the worst asshole again. A, a, a key element of Claptrap's character is that you are his subordinate. Yeah. Well, he, he when he feels good, he, yeah. Yeah. Minion. Yeah. And like, yeah. So like, it, it was funny. Cause like, if you go back to Borderlands one, like the claptrap that we know today was just primordial. 
And um, in the game, it's like the very, very primordial claptrap. But, you know, Mikey was exploring a lot, like when we were trying to market the game, we were just making whatever we could. And like, he, like we just did these episodes that like Mikey just wrote them and made them. And I was like, yeah, go for it. Let's have fun, you know? And like, sometimes I'd know the plan. Sometimes I wouldn't. Some Sometimes <laughs> we're like, hey, what if we did it this way? And then like other times you just run off the reservation and go batshit. On, on that note, can I just say what a pleasure it was to invent a character who just goes Hello! in the background <laughs> oh, yeah. in those dumb things. And it caught on so much that that ended up in poker night too. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I, they were like, can you give us hayos in like 25 different emotions? <laughs> Like a sad hey a somber hey yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, that, that yeah, Steve like character, hey that Steve character was just a goof Mikey did in one of the marketing pieces. It wasn't even in the game. It was just a marketing. It was, and it, it was such a funny. Because of Gibby. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. It was named after Steve Gibson, yeah. who's just making fun of Steve. Yeah. hey <laughs> What is a Borderland? A Borderland is the messy space between two other spaces like you know where like imagine where the highway meets the grass next to it and like there's a place in there's there's the grass and there's the highway and then there's a place where there's like little broken bits of asphalt but grass kind of growing through and it's neither the road nor the prairie but it's kind of both but it's kind of neither and it's a little messy but it's kind of cool because it's funky and it's got both things in it the Borderlands is a is a Reese's peanut butter cup. It's when it's when you <laughs> accidentally get your fucking chocolate in the peanut butter, and then it turns out you've never had a flavor like that before, and it's delicious. You just made Mikey physically whoa. His whole <laughs> face went whoa. Yeah, no, that's what that's why the title because the title makes no sense if you think about it literally. We're, we're it's a it's a it's a planet, and we're calling right. it the Borderlands. You know, but no, the Borderlands is more of an idea. It's about that uncomfortable place yeah. between two other places that that is weird and messy, but also but actually awesome and cool. And you get to figure out what it means for you. And that's like so like in the case of the design, it's perfect. It's this weird blend between role playing game and shooter. In the case of the universe. It's like a, a weird a mix between sci-fi and Western. It's defined it, less it, by what it is we, and more by what it's next to. Right. And if you talk about like the characters, it's like the, it's like the borderland between the, what the, the people like wh who they want to be and who they actually are. And, and all of the characters that like Mikey created and how we were developing it kind of reflected that attitude of like, what's the difference between how they're presenting in this moment and who they're trying to be or who they wish they could be or, and, and even, even the player, like, like it's, it's aspirational. Like I am level one when I begin, I'm not who I want to become. And, and it's about, there's the growth there and the difference between that as you progress. So that's all the borderland. And, and it's something we can all relate to, even though it's just sort of a thematic kind of underscoring to the whole thing. So you've got that concept, but you put the planet Pandora in it where the game is actually set. When we meet or when we land on Pandora as a player, it's already had quite a history. Um, it's yeah. been, it's been used and abandoned by corporations, uh, very far in the past. It was a site of, you know, alien archeology. span And, and we later learned that, uh, you know, the vaults and, and alien prisons and monsters, um, what, what was essential about Pandora, uh, that, that made this game work? I think that that it has to be the most, go ahead, you do oh. it. I was just going to say, like, to me, it's like the most dangerous place imaginable and like the sort of nihilism inherent to like living in a place like that. Cause you can die at any moment, right? Like it's so the, it's the frontier little, of frontiers. Yeah. Yeah. And it comes, with, I, you could make a bunch of money or you could die. Those are your two options. Yeah. And, and to me, it's like, I don't know. Like I, I remember when I first, the first time I was pitching the game to like what could become customers. Like when I was, I was at Gamescom and it was literally the first time we were out and I was like doing press meeting after press meeting and just, and I had this like 20 minute monologue right. of the backdrop of the planet itself. And, um, you know, th the fact that I couldn't even reduce it down below 20 minutes <laughs> and I felt like that was frustrating and painful for me to get it to 20 minutes to explain this backdrop. I think that's when I kind of, okay, this is, we have done too much work here. We've made this rich 
this is really, really rich. This game's not even going to work. <laughs> why, why did we do all that work? And we're still trying to, you know, figure out how to find the time to, you know, get good voice actors cast. Were you trying that hard? Aren't, that aren't me and Mikey. <laughs> <laughs> were, were you trying hard not to make comparisons when describing it? Let it stand on its own. No, I, I was. I didn't need to make any comparisons. When I would get into that backstory of the of the place of the universe, it was like, you know, it, it, I was using English and words people could understand, but it was like a whole new universe. So, yeah. was, you know, that that was kind of cool. You know, to know, oh, sh we are in fertile ground here. We've we've got our uh, universe. We've got our planet. Our setting. Uh, let's talk about who populates it. Our vault hunters. Um, as we've said, they're not really the good guys. Are they the better guys once you get onto Pandora? <laughs> well, they're good guys. I think that a vault hunter is, you know, they're different than the the, the guys that run the corporations, for example, you know, that, that are that are their lust for power is selfish. I think I think vault hunters have a curiosity. And I also I think they also like part of what drives a lot of them is not wanting. It's like almost, it's almost like a cyberpunk kind of idea, like not wanting that power to be misused in the hands of people that don't know how to handle power. We watch that play out over the course of the mainline games. There, there is a, uh, especially with the character of Lilith, there is a, Oh no, I've, I'm too deep into this. And now it's my responsibility to guard it uh, and to keep it safe. But initially there is, you know, I can take this, I can take this for what it's worth to me, but I think it's the difference in a vault hunter and a CEO uh, in this, in this universe to me is a vault hunter gets what they asked for and then goes, oh no, this is not um, to be exploited. This is dangerous. This is world ending. I should protect it. And then the, the corporations are going, we should further exploit this and, and get everything we can out of it. Yeah, maybe I, I, you know, we try to, I try to think about each vault hunter with their own, like there's some that are definitely more selfish than others. They're more in it for their, either their, their, their personal growth and their personal power. Some are in it for, you know, some are pure like Indiana Jones, like it belongs in a museum, Marcus, right. yeah. you know, that's why I'm doing it, you know, but there's some that are, that are totally, um, you know, they're, they're, they're they are a little mercenary like, and, and I think that range is okay. Yeah. Um, I, I think what makes, I, I, and in fact, you know, in some respects our, our villains are vault hunters too, you know, like, like they're, they're after the same stuff. They're, yeah. they're, um, but there's a reason why they're not on the co-op team. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mikey, when creating the, the, the four main vault hunters in Borderlands one, did you ever think about where they fell on that scale of survivor to opportunist? Uh, le less so than, than we did in games after that. I know Anthony spent a lot of time on that on Borderlands 2. Uh, Borderlands 1 was just kind of like, let's give you a good entry point and mm -hmm. let's make you like e excited to go through this thing. But I, yeah, Lilith wasn't much back then. I, I don't do, recall. Do you remember when we were working out like what was going to happen during the character select? Do you remember? Yeah, 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 like, yeah, that, yeah. I think that was like because we made the characters just to be fun gameplay. We weren't really thinking about their personalities or their backstories a lot. We didn't. That wasn't really a deal. Right. But then, like, okay, you're in the bus and you're going to highlight the characters as you're deciding which one to pick. And you know, Mikey, I think it was you that was like, "Hey, Marcus should say shit," and you just wrote some shit up. Yeah, yeah, how, yeah, yeah. How did the Marcus intro come about? Um, it was a patch. We were like, we're like, we have no time left. Every, like, oh fuck, nobody knows what the fuck is going on. We were so, we were so <laughs> wrapped up in like, we like, it's cause I, you know, having told that 20 minute like backdrop, like we all knew the shit, but like now we're like to the, we're really far along in development. Like the game is basically done and we're putting it in front of people and they're like, what? Like, well, there's no frame of reference. You know, right. you just go right into the rock and roll intro. And so it was literally like in the last minute, all hands, it was like Mikey, Kester, and I rolling in, just we just sat in that office together. And Mikey and I banged the script back and forth like a zillion times till the wee hours. It, of the was, morning. it was a lot. <laughs> and then Kester was just rapidly drawing the pencil sketches. Yeah. yeah. And um, I think you, you threw it in that. Did you do the, did you just throw it into After Effects and just? cut it together once we had the guy record it. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Mikey did, did the video the post on that. Effect. 
<laughs> on the yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I was like, how to make ink look like it's drawing itself. I did okay. Was that the I think most I did. punk rock element of this of this whole process? The whole game was punk rock, dude. <laughs> <laughs> the, it, the whole process was pretty punk rock, but the rock and roll intro is the most punk rock because like we that felt like a unifying thing. We also, like the game felt like it was coming together once that went in to me. We also got it in the build like it feels like it was probably days, but it feels like hours before we were like really like going to certification. According to Mikey, the last time <laughs> – Pretty, he, it was pretty late in the development. Mikey's told me before that you basically dragged a desk into an office and then for 36 hours. No, it, I just literally just sat like sat next to Mikey where his workstation was with a laptop up and we were just bat, like literally throwing lines back. Because what yeah. happened was yeah. like, for example, one of the great examples is Tannis. So yes. the original yeah. idea of Tannis that I that I had was I needed an oracle character that kind of understood the rules of the universe mm -hmm. and we were going to use echo logs to kind of give like information and it was purely informational so like I and I asked Christy hey can you write here, here's the information that I need just there were like literally like two word kind of notes write a series of what are going to be echo logs and do it kind of like you know Captain's log, star date 2147. Yeah. Yeah. I'm Patricia Tannis and I'm in my outpost. Da, da, da. And so she wrote it like that. And I'm like, oh, what have I done? And Christy, Christy was actually, no, Christy was the one that's like, I did what you asked. This is not. <laughs> Why did you ask me to do that? This is not <laughs> fun. You know? Yeah. So Mikey t then took it and he literally just, like, it was in an Excel sheet because each one was like a file that was going to go yeah. in. Like, and so he rewrote yeah. each one and it was like, this is fucking amazing. And he like created this whole like, story and character and like a whole universe around Tannis, but we lost some of the info mm. cause he was just making it good. Um, so then like, so he threw it back to me as like, okay, so I'm like trying to surgically force yeah. in some of the information. So I like rewrote it again, yeah. threw it back to him and he's like, yeah, but you took away the, so like we did that, <laughs> we did that back and yeah, forth like yeah. a lot, but we had like everything. And it was like, this was the night before the first real recording session with the, with the professional talent. Like when we're doing stuff, we can just go in the booth and just scream into a mic and that's like, Oh, right. this sounds good. I'll just record it right now and then throw it in the game. But when we're going down to the fucking studio and we're going to have professional actors in a booth with an engineer and I'm writing checks, you know, for all yeah. this, it's like, we, we should probably show up with a script. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know, we did. so we so did, we did. We did because we were up until like four in the morning the night before, uh, after having done like a bender for hours and hours and hours and hours. And we had to be there at like six. <laughs> so, when you, Mikey, when you took that, those Tannis echoes and, and started putting, uh, life and personality into them, um, at what point did you decide she was a trauma survivor and how, how did that inform her character going now forward? That was always there. I think what informed the character was me sort of coming to terms with my own sort of uh, on the spectrum diagnosis at the time, we'll say, which was gone going for a couple more years. But like I was I was sort of wanting to write a character uh, from that perspective. And I was like, what happens when they go through trauma? So it actually had a very real start point. Uh, and it turned out that was some of the darkest, most interesting, like, I don't know, it was very magnetic. Like Tannis to this day is still a character. You can just sit down and write. Was it one of those things that kind of, always there. once she revealed herself to you, it just started pouring out? Uh, once, once I got to the tape recorder and, and like sort of in my own brain going through like, why does she date a tape recorder? <laughs> Cause that's like her own way right. of dealing with her own grief and an inability to like handle all of this substantial loss. Uh, yeah. Like Tannis sort of personifies things and then becomes attached to them. Right. Right. Um, and that's obviously, uh, it's personal. It's, 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 it's dark. It's meaningful. Let's go the other way. Claptrap. Where did we come up with Claptrap? What, did you need a mascot? Did you need a guide, someone to onboard the player, or was it just fun? Well, there are two things going on there. The, the, the first thing, absolutely, you know, there was a moment when we were signing the game where I kind of I got all the designers in the room and said, like, look, I want to attach a character to each function. 
So in and so that was like that was there, but like we didn't have claptrap. So there was a, a guy, Lauren, who was a, a concept artist, and he was just doodling. And uh, claptrap wasn't even there was no plan. He wasn't even in the game. He was doodling with some robot shit, and there was this <laughs> there was this kind of trapezoidal design that uh, Brian Martell noticed, uh, and he liked it. And he's like, I like this character. Let's, we should do something with this. And he he called my attention to it, and I was like, no. Absolutely not. Like, we're not going <laughs> to put a fucking character. We're not going to make another robot character. Like, it's so, so trite. Like, everyone does the robot character. Like, it's kind of a joke now in the Star Wars series. Right. You know, it's like, you got to keep making the cute robot. And then, and then it was like, yeah, but I really, I'm like, you know, and I don't know why. I, 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 one of my Achilles heels, I don't know why, but a lot of, a lot of both my worst and also best decisions at Gearbox over the years were just trying to make Brian happy. <laughs> and like, it's literally a double edged sword. Like, I don't know. I just like making people happy. And he was around me a lot. So like, I, he really wants, so I'm like, okay, if we're going to do it, he has to be like the worst human being in the game. He has to, he has to be like the most ridiculous character in, and, and he has to be over the top. And I actually, this is kind of, weird almost timely to think about it now the uh, the character i had in mind going back to star wars was actually the rx character from star tours that was voiced by paul rubens yeah that was in the the theme park ride and the second like i like thought of that that's when i went to david eddings and said hey can you do me a favor <laughs> we're gonna just throw some random shit and i actually i actually wrote a couple of first things and raisin varna wrote some things and we just we just put him in a booth and let him ad lib that and that was for the prototype. That wasn't even in the game, but I wanted to prove it first. So we 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 made a simple model, uh, had Eddings read some shit, and and when the when the gag worked, where like the robots like being a, kind of like snarky, like look at me, I'm dancing, I dance, <laughs> you know. And then he's like, uh, I'm gonna open this door, and then he like. Uh, well, uh, open, and then the door opens, and he tries to roll through it, but it's it doesn't quite open all the way, and he smashes his head, which is also a nod to Star Wars, you know, right. like the stormtroopers walk, and and he goes ow, and then he backs up and has to wait for it to go up, like the robot miscalculating, the robot being like not merely human, but like the most fallible human, like it worked in that test, and I was like, okay, it's just gonna, happen. and then from there it just like happened, like everybody did stuff. Mikey did a lot of great stuff. Like Mikey, the, did you the have animators any animators? Did a lot of great stuff. Raisin did a lot of great stuff. David ad libbed a bunch of stuff and added a lot to the character just in the booth, you know. So, Mikey, did you add anything to Claptrap that you feel was sort of indelible and and, and remains a core to his character? Uh, yeah, I mean, we did all the shorts. Me and Dave had a bunch of fun back then, just sort of making stuff up as we went. Um. Was born out of spontaneity. Yeah, I I didn't come up with check me out. I'm dancing, so I can't really take. Too <laughs> no, he much just credit. he like, lifted that from that. a Bugs Bunny cartoon. Like, cause oh, cause wow. that's what we talked about it was like, look, do go 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 old school like Chuck Jones, Tex Avery, get like some like Three Stooges in there, you know, and you know it was just lifted like that was literally a line from 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 Bugs Bunny. Um, that's funny. Both of you. That play characters that persist throughout Borderlands. Mikey, you play Scooter. Randy, you play Crazy Earl. Um, <laughs> where do those characters come from, and is it more than just a voice? Oh, yeah. Crazy Earl's my my half-brother. Yeah, like backwoods West Virginia. Like So this is lived-in experience. <laughs> this is... Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> is his attitude backwoods West Virginia? Is um, he's a li you know what's funny is his attitude is more... My, my half-brother's attitude is more, more scooter-like. But uh, I don't know. It just gives, gives me access to that, like, that Appalachian... Right. You know... Get and, off! And, get off my fucking property! Yeah, I'm I can also the see the shotgun. I can also see <laughs> buying moonshine through a slot in a door, yeah. <laughs> you know, where you never see the, yeah, the guys yeah, selling yeah. it. Well, that was actually like we didn't have any time. We knew we needed a character. Somebody had built a head yeah. that never got stitched up yep. to anything. Yep. So all we had was a head, and I was like, "Oh, this is so good!" So, so I it was my idea. It's like, no, we we don't have any time or budget. Let's we're all we're going to use is the head. I've well, seen how the fuck like put him behind the door. There's a slot. All you see is his eyes, maybe his nose, a little bit of his mouth. Boom, close, and that's all you need. You just need a head. There are videos of people this is no totally budget saving. That's literally one like that. No time and budget. Let's just use what you have. You can find videos of people no clipping through his shed yeah. and seeing just the floating head yeah, it just cuts off the neck there's nothing there <laughs> mikey we've talked a bit about scooter but uh other than his accent and pushing it was was there anything else you were trying to do with that character 
I no, this so like I scooter was just an annoying shouter, like <laughs> just do all the lines like this all the time. <laughs> um and it was when we got to Tales from the Borderlands, I realized, oh, you're in the Telltale game now. You have to like exist outside of just shouting single <laughs> sentences. So I had to like find like what is Scooter's conversational voice. What what like, is Scooter what if sound like an when actor? Oh. <laughs> Mike, yeah, like, I had yeah. to I had to like None find of all actors. Mikey weird. became an actor to do the tales from the Borderlands. The funniest thing about Scooter to me is I've known Mikey for over twenty years. Um, I've not known Borderlands for over twenty years, but the moment scooter's vocal cadence came out i was like i know this guy i know this guy deeply because it's shout every line like this and then maybe say a little something yeah, else just, just hey it's fine but they, yeah, don't, don't care. Care. <laughs> yeah there's, there's that don't, don't even know what you're going to say pause mid-sentence yeah, yeah 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 there's it's it's um it's two it's two perspectives in one right absolutely do this but not if not if you don't want to i mean i guess you don't want I, to so there was a line just just to say the the scooter line to me that personifies scooter or um is in the third DLC from Borderlands 1 where he yells Jesus Christ titty cinnamon <laughs> I can't believe I got away with that <laughs> to this day I still can't believe I got away with that it's in a game that shipped I did that I have done this to you we, um, by, by the time we got to the third DLC, I think we filtered out all of the uh, hardcore evangelists. <laughs> At that point, they, we were safe. Other than Scooter's- Jesus Christ, Teddy <laughs> Cinnamon. Uh, like there's no oh, there's no better four words if, to combine uh, together. Uh, other than Scooter's uh, final catch a ride as he, as he met his end. Um, catch a ride! Is, yeah, I feel like "Where are you, Scrappy?" is the other line that that defines Scooter uh, as tragedy, his personal tragedy, uh, when his dog dies or, or runs away or is is taken from him. I there's yeah, ev but like everyone in Borderlands experiences tragedies, and to Scooter, I think writing the poem to that girl in two is just as tragic. As losing his dog, <laughs> he's he's uh, a collection of tragedies. <laughs> he, he, yeah. Aren't we all? Did you know Scooter died a virgin, but he didn't? I can't understand that unless you explain it. Yeah, Scooter thinks he died a virgin, <laughs> but he was actually extremely drunk, blackout when he lost his virginity, so he has no memory of actually. Where do we find that out? Yeah, this is. Someday we'll tell this. This is a deep, Someday deep we'll lore. Deep lore. <laughs> this is this is the scooter deep lore. Where's my scooter DLC? Damn it! Scooter That's only what DLC. I'm saying. Um, it just unlock this lore. Vault Hunters, this podcast is launching alongside a new bundle from Gearbox and 2K that includes every Borderlands game to date, all for one great price. It's called the Borderlands Collection Pandora's Box, and you don't even need a vault key to open it, just a valid credit card or debit card. Unless you talk to Crazy Earl, he'd probably accept Moonstones or Iridium Shards or your underwear as payment. What you want? Yeah, I have no idea. Uh, grab it on Xbox, PlayStation, and PC. As we've talked about these characters and this this setting, is Pandora a place for outcasts? Uh, is it, are you rejected by society or are they rejecting what they see around them? From my perspective, based on the audience that Borderlands has built, it is definitely a place for the outcasts. Well, you, you've either been left behind or cast aside or you're going there for a purpose. And sometimes you're going to disappear or sometimes you're going to find the thing it's like alaska yeah yeah so there's like <laughs> there's there's all so you have people that are specifically there facing the danger because they are there for the vault or they're there for the iridian artifacts and you have other people that are there trying to just get away from the attention right. it's like the out like no one will you're find crazy the earls and whatnot and then there's other people that were just left behind they were there and they were abandoned and they could be good and useful or, or they could be psychos, but they were abandoned. And so they're just surviving and all three are kind of living together in this, this yeah. place. We've talked about a few characters that came about out of gameplay necessity. Was angel one of those? Yeah. That's a Randy question. I mean, dude, I mean, you were there. I, you know, we needed, I needed a different that like her, her original character. I just called her voice of God. Um, 
Vogue. We called her Vogue. Right. Um, because we needed, it was, it was so, I needed something to direct the player that the player could just trust and go, okay, I, this is what I got to do now. So like, like she literally says like, I'm not going to tell you shit. You don't even know what I am, but mm-hmm. you get off the bus, go do the thing. There's going to be a robot. Talk to him. And like, <laughs> and you're like, yes, ma'am, I'll do that. Like, yes, I'll do that. Like, so she needed to be this voice that was like, trustworthy and inviting that you had no clue what it was about. And in fact, we yeah, didn't I quite shot know. It I just knew you, we needed, we needed to pull the player through some things and we needed a voice. We needed to manifest that in a voice. It couldn't be just text on screen. It had to be a character that was going to give us enough so that I'm like, okay, I, I, I kind of know what my purpose is and I have, I have a, a mission to, to move ahead and I have enough motivation to, to, figure this out. And that's what, that's what her purpose was. As, as we used her for that, we developed a character and we developed a story. And a lot of that, you know, came between one and two. When did the decision, when did the decision to show the Hyperion satellite that Angel was potentially broadcasting from come into play? That was just, um, that actually started from a skybox goal. Like we're like working on Borderlands too. It's like, Hey, wouldn't it be cool to have the, like, we want this thing always there in the sky and it's a big H, you know? So it's like handsome Jack's H. Is it is an ego thing? Is it a Hyperion H, you know? Um, oh, I meant the, the end reveal that, oh, that oh, oh. our sort of after credits stinger. Oh, that thing with the interplanetary ninja assassin. That was just Mikey goofing off. <laughs> like that, that, like the interplanetary ninja assassin was literally just a dumb Mikey idea when I, one day I'm like, yeah, that doesn't well, suck. Just do a dumb it. Mikey idea idea because now it's I a great Mikey idea harass me on Twitter no I think it was I, awesome I like I, it wouldn't be in the game if I didn't like it remember how ruthless I was with brothers in arms like yeah, I cut like two-thirds sure. of your shit <laughs> yeah I write too much that's good that's what you want in a writer well yeah I mean you, you get a lot of good stuff and then you if you can cut it down yeah. to the best of the good stuff then you're just in good shape. I remember when we were kind of like talking about the ending and like i remember randy specifically talking about like wow i'm at the beginning and the ending matters a little and that's not the word you use but like does that drug anything well like I, sp- make sure the ending blows or the the beginning blows I, them away of course but i like i like the non sequitur at the end when we were falling back because my original plan was the whole thing was going to be a loop a loop like, yeah the yeah, like after loop. like after we recorded that after you kill the 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 tentacle, Marcus pulls up in a boss in the bus, and he invites you to get on the bus, and then you're in the bus picking your character. The bus to New it. Game Plus, and it's a bus. Yeah. Yes, it's a bus. <laughs> exactly, it's a bus to New Game Plus, and then it's just in like a literally infinite loop where like what the fuck's happening? Yeah. Like, like, and we, I was gonna play it straight too. Like, you get on the bus. And then you're in character select <laughs> and then, okay, you just do it. And then you get off the bus and clock traps and you're like, what the heck? Like <laughs> what killed that sanity? <laughs> better, Cooler heads prevail. Better, better game developers <laughs> than me. <laughs> um, let's talk about the beginning and end. Um, because I think everybody has a lot of feelings about both. The rock and roll intro is iconic to the borderlands franchise. Uh, and the first song ain't no rest for the wicked by cage. The elephant where, how did you pick that song? That was, that's a good one. So Mikey and the guys were working on the, the rock, what we called, well, we didn't call it the rock and roll intro. Actually, it was all, there was no music in it. There was no music in it. And it was the craziest thing because I had spent, so there's this radio show, um, that, uh, Connie, who's a gearbox, uh, I think she was our receptionist, her husband, um, or boyfriend or whatever partner ran, had this radio show on the local alternative station called the adventure club. Was it on the Eagle? Uh, no, it's on edge. So basically, you know, every radio station, people just send demos and they don't play them. Right. There's just thousands of songs coming in all the time. And so the adventure club, he was digging through this stuff, finding things and just playing it. And I was, I liked listening to the show because that's where you discover weird shit, right? So I listened to that show and, uh, and he played this song from this band out of Kansas City, uh, Cage the Elephant, and it was called In One Ear. And I was like, that, this is their dude, what the fuck? Like I, it'd been a while since I heard something like good on it, like really like on adventure called like that's going to work. And so, um, I went home and I immediately started Googling him because you know, like when you're listening to the radio, it's like you hear the song and then the guy's, Hey, that, that was blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, 
like I said it to myself 50 times in my head right. so I wouldn't forget it as I'm driving home. Like I was driving in, in the car listening to this and I get home and I had it ingrained in my brain. So I Google searched and I found this track that was like at the time it wasn't anything. It was, um, uh, I think there were like 300 views on YouTube. Yeah, there's no guarantee and in 2009 that a band has an online presence. That's right. Of any kind. Yeah, yeah. Like we're primordial social media at this point, right? So like I, so, and it was, and I listened to the song. I probably listened to it. I, I probably contributed as many views <laughs> that night to what it already right. had on on this this little video they had made. And uh, and so I go into work the next morning and Mikey's like, hey, dude, you, you need, he, Mikey was probably, he said, dude, you got to You got to come here. I, I think I cracked this. And he's like, what if? What if the intro is to music and he play and he's recut it with a Bob Dylan track. And oh, it was, it was a, Dylan. That's right. It was Bob Dylan and it was a, an all acoustic and it was, it was, I can't remember the song. I can't remember the song, but I was like, this is fucking dope, Mikey. And also like, like I know, I know how to talk to Bob Dylan. There's no fucking universe. He's going to let us license the song for a game with, right. uh, with 87 bazillion guns. in right. it. There's I really no, wanted to try is yeah. the dumb part. Also That's how young I was. Yeah. And then also, um, <laughs> also I, I, I kind of thought like, but what if, what if, since we're doing everything else new, what if we introduced the world to a new band with this? So I said, let's do, I listened to this track like 50 times and it's per like, it's, it's crazy. Like, take what you just edited, turn the music to off, play the video. I'm going to play this song at the same time, and we're just going to do it on top of each other. And it fucking worked the first time, and it was just un it was just unbelievable. And, like, both Mikey and I were sitting there going, like, what the fuck? Yeah, we got to find these guys. What the <laughs> fuck? It was crazy how magical yeah, it was. Yeah. And then, uh, and then I called up Christoph because he used to work at BMG. He's the, he was the president of 2K Games. I'm like, I don't know how to do this, but you got to get me the song. You got to figure this out. And it was a mess because they signed up with some like small like UK label. Like, yeah, they, they live there now. It, well, they're all over the place. But yeah, <laughs> they went there for a while. But uh, I don't know if they're – are they there now? I believe they okay, are. I think maybe. they're London-based. Okay. They were there for a minute, and I think maybe they've been going back and forth. But um, uh yeah, and they ended up having to do like that label had to do a deal with Sony so that they could make it happen. Probably the craziest phone call that small label ever got too. Oh yeah, yeah. It was nuts. And then like and the 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 coup de gras, of course, was like a couple months later, Sony calls me asking permission when they debut their album, if they can put as heard in Borderlands right. as like the little invader at Best <laughs> Buy, because that's how you sold music was on a compact disc yep. in a physical store. And I was just like, this yep. is the greatest day of my life. The first, time I, pretty great. the first time I ever heard that song, I was at a house party. The trailer for Borderlands comes on. I happen to be holding an acoustic guitar because it was a house party, yeah. Mikey. You know how I do. <laughs> yeah, that is true. And okay. I started playing along to it, and the guy whose house it was was like, what the fuck, <laughs> what? You can play this song? This is the most walking fucking song I've ever heard. <laughs> it like, is, it is. It's something. a great song. Yeah, they're, 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 there's, there's I, a, a logic to it. <laughs> I, being totally honest, Randy came in like super excited. I found the song, I found the song, and I'm like... You listen you? to weird stuff. I don't believe you. And then he <laughs> plays it. And I was so like, because it was the song. Do you remember at all what the Dylan track was? No. It, it was some wandering guitar. It wasn't, like, a, it wasn't it was, even a, like a B-side. It was like a deep cut. Right, Dylan song. right. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. uh, I'm like RT Michael boy trying to <laughs> um, we've, Dylan B-sides. Did you set a bar with that rock and roll intro that it demands carrying on throughout the franchise? Um, two was hard. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, that, we pained over that too. I remember when Brian came in and said, hey, there's, you got to listen to these guys and, and played the heavy for me the first time mm -hmm. I listened to the heavy. And it was, uh, I think he played How You Like Me Now, which we did license and use for, I think we used it for the end credits. We used like four heavy set songs. The heavy yeah. song. Once, once, once we decided, okay, short change hero and Mikey line, leaned into that for the Borderlands Two intro. Then, I had to fight for that. Yeah. People were like too sad, and I was like, no. <laughs> Let um, me have talked, my emotions. 
<laughs> we, we've talked a bit about the 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 ending of Borderlands One. By, by the way, the heavy just to come back to it. Like we, that's that song was made the, in Borderlands Three. It was made for Borderlands Three. Really? Yeah. Like like I like I went to both KG Elephant and the Heavy, and I was like, okay, let's let's do this right. We store we kind of first sketched out an outline. So I told them what we were doing for the game and for the intro. And they're like, okay, so they started sketching demos. And then we took some of the like weird kind of tests they each were doing and we storyboarded out our intro. And then I brought the storyboards back and pitched them each. And they were making songs to it. The heavy just like leaned in and they went directly to the like it was like we're on target. The cage were like their the song is awesome, but they were getting like they were artists, you know, so they were kind of exploring their own shit a little bit. Right. So that we ended up licensing their song too for the end credits, I think. But um, but yeah, that that heavy song, like I mean, that was that was made for Borderlands Three. Like, did, the, did you the feel the video like, is a Borderlands Three video? Like at that point, you can now say reference this. This this is real. Yeah, everyone knows this. It's in culture well, now. Now, right to that. Yeah, I think that was part of it. But I was just grateful for their incredible music. So it was really fun to collaborate and work with those guys. And it was so fun to be in the room with them. And the time, one time, like with Cage, I drove down to the. They were playing in Austin. And they're like, hey, just you know, come down. And, and I went down there, and just we just hung out after their show, um, and just talked about the game and talked about the music. And that was actually before I met with them in the boardroom with the with the outline and the storyboards. We're just talking like just influence. Yeah. And yeah, it was it was cool. Um, Those guys are dope. As far as the <laughs> ending of Borderlands, um, the game ends with the re revelation of the the destroyer the tentacle monster but then it content the story continues through the DLC. Yeah. Do you feel like right. that story wraps up in the DLC or do you feel like it's just a continuing story that goes throughout Borderlands 2 and 3 and pre-sequel? I, I think of the DLC for Borderlands 1 as like television episodes set in the universe of this Movie, yeah, you know, if it, like to make an analogy, I think I think the Borderlands One has a beginning, middle, and end for Borderlands One, and that leads, you know, then then we 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 take up the next chapter in Borderlands Two. I think the DLC those can be standalone television episodes. I don't think they like yeah. are sequentially meaningful to the. Um, like I could take General Knox as its own beginning, middle, and end. Right. I can take the Zombie Island of you know Doctor Ned's own beginning, middle, and end. And Mikey, we had talked a bit about uh, interplanetary ninja assassin claptrap. How did that start? You had said that it might it was uh, something in Photoshop. Oh yeah, I I had a big Photoshop file of all the title cards, so I just made up a fake title card, uh, and I think we kind of went with it because it got half a smile. Who looked over <laughs> your shoulder and said, "Oh, that's funny." That goes in the yeah. game. Oh, oh, he's a ninja assassin, you say. <laughs> well, that's, that's something. Um, when you're developing the game, um, I feel like I already know the answer to this question, but it, it seems like fun is at the forefront, um, especially with this first one. It's not, you're, you were focused more on gameplay and fun than building a franchise. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, look, you don't, you always hope that what you're doing is going to be meaningful enough to right. justify more effort, but you never count on that. What do you, if anything, if anything, like our tragedy is maybe hoping too much for that, right? <laughs> where we like plant seeds and like, you know, I'm still trying to finish the brothers in arms situation stuff, you know? And it's like, I feel like situation, <laughs> situation, <laughs> situation. Like I feel like unfinished business there, you know? And, um, uh, uh, and then we definitely make that for ourselves with Borderlands. The first game was, you know, it was definitely Old West. We were figuring it out. But the fun in making it, I think, increases with each game because a couple yeah. things happen. The people that were there for the previous game or the games before it are getting more mastery and mm. more comfort and understanding of what we've got on our hands and how to play with it. And we're having more fun playing in the space than just surviving to get through the difficulties of game development. And then when you add to that the fact that people join us because they want right. to be a part of it and they've proved to the people around them that they have capability and talent that are, are worthy enough for the people that are already here to let them join the team. And then they're just fucking stoked that they get to be part of that process and make something cool for Borderlands. And I'm stoked because all, all these crazy fresh ideas come in and make it even. So to me, it's like the fun keeps 
growing. That's uh, interesting. In the process. In so the process. Border- and I think it comes through in the games. Like I think Borderlands 3 is a bigger, better game than Borderlands 2, which is a bigger, better game than Borderlands 1. So Borderlands 2 is the first time you had the opportunity to bring people on the team who played Borderlands 1. Yes. But did not work on it. That's right. How did that change there? Was there any sort of um, old guard versus new guard perspective or was no, it all just that, a big family? Gearbox doesn't do that. We, there's something about our culture where that's not really a thing. Like Because the, for someone to join the company, the people they're working with have to invite them. And so there tends to be this like natural and culturalization that happens where we're all like, this is amazing. We all get to work together. I can't believe it. You're so talented. I can't believe you want to work with me. And they're like, oh my God, I can't believe you are inviting me to work with you. And it's ah, and we're just stoked to be like in each other's presence because there's so much amazing talent around. This is, I just feel grateful. I get to work with so many dope people. Uh, we touched briefly on the original visual style for the game being realistic. Um, what led to the drastic switch and when did that occur? Hmm. Yeah. I, do you want me to speak to that? I can speak to that. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't remember exactly. I remember like the people. I remember yeah. Brian Cousins and, and Brian Martell and Carl Shedd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Carl and, and, uh, and Stephen Cole. So what happened yes, was, Stephen Cole. yeah, yeah. So what happened was, you know, we, 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 there was definitely something wrong. The art direction did not fit with the vibe of what the game design needed. There was, it, there, we felt the fracture for a long time. And um, we had um, this, weird, this weird moment where there were some folks at the company that w- had an idea for how to try some stuff. And they, so what, here's, how, here's my experience. I was doing my usual like walk around, just talk to people, see what's going on. And then somebody said like, oh, dude, have you seen what Carl's been working on? I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> is is Carl not working on what he's supposed to be working on? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, oh, never mind. I didn't. Uh, no. So, so I, I go to Martel. I'm like, I'm like, what, what, what's going on, dude? You got a little skunk works going on over there in the corner? What's going on? <laughs> Brian's like, okay. You know how we are not happy, like we're all, like the art's not working. Like, yes, we think we have something, but we didn't want to tell you until we look at it. I'm like, you can't just like divert like all these resources though. Right. Like, I, Cause I, like I always have designer brain, but also production brain like going simultaneously. So especially back then, cause I'm kind of like wearing a lot of hats. I'm re- I'm accountable for the budget and I'm accountable for the quality, which is like insane to have to manage both, right? So um, so at that time, that period in time, um, you know, I said, okay, look, I'll tell you what, who, who are you taking? And he like, there's like five guys. And I said, you have three weeks and then you're gonna show me where you're at and we're gonna make the call. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll decide whether this lives or dies. And so they went in the tank for three weeks and they they did it and um and then the meeting the meeting was scheduled and i remember like walking into the meeting thinking to myself like first of all brian left town like he was like he wasn't even in the meeting like i was like oh is he terrified like why did he like does he not <laughs> want to be there for judgment day like what's happening and i and i'm walking in the meeting going i am an idiot because we're like we're 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 like alpha like we got to get to like whatever this is i have to shoot it in the head and all I did was get them attached, let them get three weeks more attached to this thing before I right. came. Like this is the worst, like I'm, an, I'm a dumbass. I'm the worst producer ever. I can't believe I let this happen. And that's what I was thinking going into it. But, there, I, but then there were reasons why I let, like there were reasons why I let it happen. And the, the people involved in what we were trying to accomplish in the situation was like, I, I guess at the time I thought it was worth the risk. But going into it, it's like, it doesn't matter what they show me. I have to kill this. And then we sat down and they showed me this little vignette they'd made with the firestone. Basic, yeah, it was, it was it was primordial firestone basically with yeah. the art direction. And I was like it works. It definitely fucking it's awesome and it definitely it's distinct and it definitely solves the 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 dissonance between yeah. the game design and the art. So I was like can we even do it? And fucking Stephen Palmer who's producing at the time genius. He tracked everything they did and how long it took. And he compared that to existing schedule and said, not only can we do it, but it's actually more efficient than what we were doing wow. before from a production perspective. And I was like, touchdown. So then I directed this little teaser trailer that I, because I'm like, okay, we're going to do this, 
but I have to now sell it to our publishing partner because they're like financing all this and taking all the risk. I'm going to radically divert the the art direction after we've announced the game, after we were on the cover of Game Informer magazine, after we've gone to Gamescom with this product. Like how that so I did I had to like convince them. So wow. so I I made I directed this trailer that we made. I there's a song that my um my dad had or my my dad had this album I used to play and and the song on it called uh um uh, green fields by the brothers four. And it was like this eerie kind of thing, but like, I didn't, there was like, there's like this weird kind of turn every, me- like in the second measure or third measure of every verse. So I, I re-edited the song to like truncate it a little bit. And, um, yeah. And then I'm, and then I directed this trailer with some of the assets from the, from the thing. And I, and I brought that with me to, to San Francisco. I flew out to San Francisco First, I showed Greg Gobi, who's like the creative guy at 2K. He's like, "I love it." And then I, and then I, uh, and then I showed the marketing people and the sales people. And like, this is what we need. And then I showed Christoph last in a room full of those people who had already, oh, yeah. who had already evangelized it to. And it was, we, we, we did it. What do you think it's done for Borderlands as a franchise to have a style that you can recognize from a hundred feet away? Well, I think it's a double-edged sword, frankly, if I'm really honest about it. On one level, it's like awesome. I love it. I love that it's distinctive. I love that we have a unique look. On the other level, I think it's put a ceiling on the franchise that's been hard to deal with. One of my most painful experiences was that uh, I went to – so GameStop every year. Back back in 2009, 2010, 2000, through, all the way through like 2015, they were the number one video game retailer on the planet. And, and they, every year they have a massive convention uh, where they'd go somewhere like Las Vegas and there'd be like 5,000 store managers that manage each of the GameStop stores uh, around the country and around the world. And, uh, and so like a 5,000 person convention is a pretty big freaking convention, you know? So, and, and we'd go there and we'd talk about the games we're selling and we have a booth, you know? Da, da. So it was like, it was like E3, but for only GameStop managers, <laughs> it was crazy. So I'm there and I'm running the booth and we're talking about, I think we're, I don't remember what we were pimping probably DLC or something, um, gave me the year edition. And managers kept coming up to me, and, and they all had a story about how much they love Borderlands, how they how they discovered it, and how and, and I heard the story enough times where it became like the same story in my mind. Here was the story. Yeah, I have this one customer, and he loves shooters, and he came in, and I'm like, dude, you got to try this game. And he looks at it, and he's like, I don't think so, man. I don't like cartoons. I'm like, no, trust me. You got to try it. Just take it home and play it. If you don't like it, I'll give you a refund. And he takes it home, and they freaking loved it, man, and they loved it. And I <laughs> sold that copy for you, and I'm like, and they're thinking I love this story. Yeah. I'm fucking dying inside. <laughs> I'm dying inside because what, it, what's, what it's actually telling me is the default level of that customer was to reject it because right. of the art. Reject the game because of the art. And I was like, oh, you're killing me here, man. Can't we just be artists and be cool? Nope, you got to be commercial. Is that and only in the first one, though? Does you feel like that switched after it was established? Well, I think it's a thing. I think it's a thing. I think it's why there's still people, 20 million people every time showing up for Call of Duty. So <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think realism is a thing. I think there's a certain mind. It's like when you're a child and you look at a painting. If they showed you Picasso and they showed you some like, like senior in high school trying to do realism – the child's going to, oh, that's the better painting because right. it looks more realistic. And they can't even identify the Picasso. That's really crazy. It's um, fucked up, but that's the way the world works. And, you know, it makes me cry, but <laughs> here we are. <laughs> Let's not end there. Uh, <laughs> but you know what? You got to just do it. You do the art because yeah. you fucking love it. And you do the art because I agree. that's what, inter- like, art and entertainment are a. You know, and entertainment is a commoditized medium, but art is expression, and that's you can't entertain without having some art in it. Like if you're just soulless, like there's no entertainment from the art you find at IKEA. When you do, yeah. you, when you compl- have you have you ever seen a few billies stuck together with nice lighting? They look really nice. <laughs> Billy bookcases, nobody, anybody. Okay, uh, completing development of Borderlands. Uh, what'd you do? It was the lighting that made it art. <laughs> Did you celebrate? Did you sleep for a month? Drink? Like I drank a lot of Red Bull that night. I remember <laughs> when we went in gold, or when we. There's were, several moments, right? There's re- there's gold, release to manufacturing, launch party. We did a launch party. Then there's like we hey. go, we do the midnight showing where we go and like people are gonna buy it. We're they're waiting in line at GameStop and you go and you go meet them and sign copies right. and you buy your own copy of the game. And then there's like a month later when it actually hits you that you're, you didn't fuck it all up. 
when did you feel like it was something special? Was it before release or after? When Martin at the Academy called me and asked me to do a talk at the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences annual summit, I'm like, okay, that never had, they don't call you. Right. Everybody wants, you know, so that's interesting. So I did the talk and then I remember like I was up on stage saying like, I, I don't know. I think it feels like this game is going to be like a 3 million unit seller. I think it feels like that's the truth. It's crazy, right? Like when did you know Mikey that it was something special? I, uh, so definitely I had this idea in my head all through all three brothers in arms games that I worked on that someone was going to tattoo one of these beautiful lines, one of these poetic nothings that Matt Baker elicits to the universe. Like I figured somebody would tattoo that. And then the first game tattoo I ever saw that someone took a line I wrote was Claptrap from the zombie Island of Dr. Ned. And he pulls up a sleeve and it says, I pooped where you're standing. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and it's claptrap from the beginning of that game and i was like oh oh that's that, that cuz like you you think somebody's going to be like oh this line you wrote it moved me to tears and i, I had to where you're standing. no yeah. i pooped where you're standing and, that, and that's i was like oh off. i get it oh i get it that's a tattoo that's not coming <laughs> off that guy's going to be 80 explaining that to his great grandkids well no, there was a there was a dlc in 2009 yeah, for this long, game it was before the water wars it's not technically in canon, but who could tell anyway? They were called videoed games. <laughs> God. Um, so that's when you knew it was special. When did you know it was huge? Borderlands 2. Yeah. Was it just seeing the fans come in droves? or, or was there it, ha- pr- it happened a lot faster on 2 than 1. Because 1 is like a tail that just goes sideways forever. And then 2 Spike. felt like a hit. Two is a spike. Yeah. 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 That what? was that was a that was an impact. That was like a meteor impact when two hit. And that was like, okay, we're yeah. And that's when I got like, okay, I gotta get serious here. When did you know there had to be a two? The second after one shipped. Right. <laughs> Yeah, like so, like we, the, like as one shipping, we're like we're onto this. So like I, we already had, we were already working on the first. There was no DLC plan when we were making one. We we turned around Zombie Island to Doctor Ned in like forty five days. Wow, like we just swarmed the shit out of that. How did the release of Borderlands One immediately change Gearbox, or did it? Yeah, I mean, we leveled up a lot. Um, we, you know, I from a from my point of view, strategically, I kind of did the same thing I did with with uh, when when we had Brothers in Arms, where I'm like, okay, except the thing I did differently. With Brothers and, Brothers in Arms, we basically abandon it in order to because we can only do one thing at a time. So we abandon it in order to focus on um, the new thing of Borderlands. So the thing we did differently was okay. Now we're going to double down on this thing that works, and but simultaneously we're going to get other boats in the water, and that's like things like Battleborn happened, but also things that are coming. Like like, like we I wanted to get more boats in the water um, and figure out how to scale the creative engine. So a lot of a lot of energy between two and three went about okay, how do we scale our creative engine? But of course three has to be bigger than two. So that took a while. Did opportunities start coming your way as opposed to you going out and finding them? Um it's always been the case. There's always been inbound and you know us us out there. Like a, that's it's just, you know, the, the credibility gets higher with each it's I don't know how many original IPs we have to create that become blockbusters, but apparently when you when you do <laughs> more. when you do more of them, the credibility grows and people trust you more. So, <laughs> uh, Mikey, I know that you have done the convention circuit for years for for all of your uh, Borderlands related projects, but also your own projects. Have you yeah. had any interactions with people that that had a particular connection to Borderlands? Oh God, hundreds. I actually probably thousands, if I were to guess, like. That's Borderlands always felt like something special when you go out and you meet the people dressing up like the characters and you hear their stories. And I don't know. I, I've always found like Borderlands to be a game about finding people that are, you know, pushing against the world in their own way. Did you actually marry Two Borderlands fans? I did. I did. Uh, with Chris Straub live on stage. At a Gearbox panel at PAX Prime, 
Randy, do you remember? Yeah, we were on the main stage. It was one of the past. Yeah. I think it was Pax yeah. Prime. Yeah, we were on the main stage, and you, Mikey was the minister. That was beautiful. Were you already later ordained? They, I, I think later they asked we me to sign their them baby. Not too long ago, I signed their baby later, and they tattooed your signature on the baby. God, I hope not. Uh, Mikey, Whoa. were you already ordained, or did you have to like rapidly go no, onto a I, website? Or he's an ordained minister of the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. <laughs> Uh, hey, are you ordained? And I was like, not that I know of. Uh, and he's like, would you like to be? Would you like to marry two people at a uh, at a panel? And I was sure. like, sure. <laughs> and it was great. It was electric. It was so fun. I, I just saw them uh, the other day. Michael just retired from the Navy. Wow. And they're still married? They are still married. Borderlands is forever. It makes the, it makes the love grow. <laughs> and they're not the only ones. It's crazy. It's crazy how yeah. many friendships were made and and relationships built. It's clear the two of you have had uh, a great deal of impact, especially on this first Borderlands game. But how do you feel like? What's one thing that you feel like you put your personal stamp on Borderlands? Was it a bit of dialogue? One character? Like Mikey? Was it Tannis? Yeah, I mean, it is Tannis, but I do kind of have to go back to Jesus Christ, Titty Cinnamon. I, I like, I'm going to be wearing that W for the rest of my life. I did that in a game. Yeah. Um, I think for me, it's the literal stamp. Um, just drawing, like designing and drawing that icon with the, the vault icon. Oh, yeah. That was you. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I have a process where I just get on a whiteboard and just start scribbling, doodling, and pretty much done all the icons and for all, all the gearbox games. And what about this one? Gearbox yeah. logo. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Martell and I worked on that a lot, but yeah. Um, the, um, yeah, that, that one it's, we, and that like speaking of tattoos, it's still like when I, when I was, when I was planning, I was like, okay, I want it simple enough where someone could like carve it into a bathroom stall or a desk right. at school or something. <laughs> the idea of someone tattooing it on their body actually makes me like a little uncomfortable. Cause that's not coming off, but, uh, it can be covered up, I guess, but man, but a lot of people have done it. It's wow. pretty wild. A, uh, a literal stamp. We're going to wrap up with, uh, just a couple of bits of borderlands trivia and see, uh, you, you, you guys have already covered most of the trivia questions as things that you absolutely know. You've left me with two, uh, number one, and I know, you know, this, so I'm going to ask Mikey the in credit scene. Uh, what is the song? that plays over the end credits of Borderlands 1. Champion? No Heaven by DJ Champion. That's right. He's got it. Uh, Borderlands has received... By the way, you know what happened there? So we were... It was Martell and I were at a... Um, we were at a, a DICE event, and they, the talent they got was DJ Champion, and he had six guys yeah. with axes, like, in a row at the party, just, just playing fucking rock guitar. With his as he was DJing to yeah. it, and it was like this is the coolest fucking thing I ever seen in my <laughs> life. And I kind of went back and looked at more of his stuff, and that's when we found No Heaven. That's awesome. Um, Mikey cut the shit out of that with some of the trailer stuff we did. Like, hell yeah, that was the first real game trailer I ever did. Yeah. Was the DJ Champion one? Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. Oh uh, no. <laughs> that song is stuck in my head forever. Yeah. Borderlands has been awarded a Guinness Book of World Records record for most guns in a video game. Do you know what the number on the official certificate is? 16.7 million. Okay. I don't know. 17.75 million. You were close. Oh, very close. Without going over. I was over. close. You were very close. If you had bet $1, that's, Mikey that's would have won. Yeah, uh, I guess we. D I guess the math had to be done to get the certification from Guinness. <laughs> this is a trivia item. We that beat I that. Well, by the way, we beat that record with Borderlands Two and with Borderlands Three, but we don't have certificates for that. I didn't so reaward you. That's. I'm kind of frustrated. I, I remember doing the Borderlands Three trailer because you guys invited me back to do the uh, the launch trailer or the announcement trailer. Sorry, um, and I fought for the billions of guns thing. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> um, Mikey, this is one that I, I feel like I'm just asking you for clarification on this trivia item. Many of the characters' names have particular significance. Roland, Mordecai, and Lilith are all Old Testament names. That comes from Matt Armstrong, I think, yep. from the original story. Because, like, Brick is sort of added in on top of that. And Tannis is, is the city where the Ark is supposedly buried. Yep. So there's a lot of... Yeah, we're just goofing around. 
Like Matt, yeah. Matt liked that. And honestly, like if you ask him about it, he'd probably say like, yeah, I think people will like the goal is to have people try to imagine there's meaning there. Right, right, right. <laughs> but, They're yeah. also just good names. Yeah, too, great so names. No matter how you look at it. Yeah. Um, and then there is uh, a, a trivia item that other characters' names are based on the middle names of one of the writer's siblings. Which one of you is this? I don't know. That's interesting. Could be true. Yeah, I I'm calling shenanigans <laughs> on that one. You know that it could be it could be a Simon Hurley thing, dude. Like frankly, which it, I wouldn't be surprised. True. It could be a Simon Hurley thing. The last thing yeah. I want to do is he, find he out. Got, he got some stuff. He got some stuff in there in his in his time with us. <laughs> Between the two of you, and it sounds like you've already had this contest. Who does the best, Marcus? I'm Randy. Gonna, I'm going to offer Randy. this challenge. If I mean, we could try it. Should we try it? I'd like to yeah. hear. Yeah. So you want to hear a podcast in your best, Marcus? You want to go first? All right. So you want to hear a podcast, eh? <laughs> Not bad. Yeah. Not Is bad. Okay. okay. So you want to hear a podcast, eh? Oh, there's just a little, more, there's a little bit more. There's a little bit more spit in Randy's. You're, <laughs> Randy's Watto is like space brain. I can't. Oh, he's got a legendary Watto. <laughs> Have I got a podcast for you? That's <laughs> pitch perfect. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Thanks for joining us, Vault Hunters. If you have ears, please subscribe to the audio version of Echoes from the Borderlands, wherever podcasts are available. If you are lucky enough to have eyes, any eyes at all, they don't have to be yours, please subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash gearboxofficial to see future episodes. If you play video games and you'd like to get every current Borderlands game at one great price, go snag our new bundle, the Borderlands Collection, Pandora's Box, available now on Xbox, PlayStation, and PC. Huge thanks to my guests, Randy Pitchford and Mikey Newman, as well as our behind-the-scenes heroes, April Johnson, Dakota Warren, Matthew Ward, Rob Fernandez, and Hannah Terry. Our theme song is Get Out of My Head by Wandermine. For Echoes from the Borderlands, I'm Joel Watson. See you next time, Vault Hunters. Hunters.